You are listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, a podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm joined by Alexandra Crapandano, a James Beard award-winning writer and dessert columnist for the Wall Street Journal for over a decade. She's also the author of Gâteau, The Surprising Simplicity of French Cakes. And she's here to discuss a word that evokes just that simplicity, cake. Welcome to the podcast, Alexandra. Thank you so much for joining me. Could you give our listeners a little bit of insight into who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Hi, Emily. So glad to be on. I am a, oh my God, I I wear so many different hats, but my ties to France run long and deep. So I kept going to France with my parents as a kid because my mother, who's a journalist, was writing a letter from Europe for the New Yorker and was basically back and forth. So when I was 10 years old, we actually moved to France and I started attending school and My parents got me a great big dog, 125 pound Bouvier from Normandy. And so armed with this, you know, incredible leader, basically, uh, I was able to walk around in the afternoons with a freedom that I never had in New York because Paris was so much safer and I had this huge dog. And I just, I fell completely in love with living in the city. And I also fell in love with looking into food shop windows and very, very often going right inside. And in France, where you can take your dog anywhere, I could just pop in and say hello. And I used to go to the cheese shop and they would give him cheese and they would give me cheese. And I used to, you know, do that at Poilin. I did that everywhere in the neighborhood. And I really became fascinated with the way that people shop for food in France long before I cooked. And my mother is a fantastic cook, but I really began to listen to the way people would talk to a shopkeeper about the cheese that they were buying or about, you know, what cake to buy or about, you know, what strawberries were perfectly ripe for that day. And I got a very strong window into the seriousness with which the French approach food, but also just this this sense of it being a daily pleasure, that shopping for food was a daily pleasure and that cooking it was going to be at least at home quite simple and really about produce and about knowing what your ingredients are and and knowing how essentially not to ruin them. I think when you talk about shopping for French food specifically, I think one of the things that I often say kind of tongue in cheek when I'm giving guided tours of Paris's food shops is that walking into a pâtisserie almost feels like walking into a jewelry shop, right? Like it's so ornate and crazy. And the word that I wanted to discuss with you is a word that I know is really close to your heart and a word that I think a lot of learners of French would be surprised to hear we have in French, because when you're learning French in school, the word you learn for cake is gâteau. But there is another word of un cake, and then we have une pâtisserie. So all of these different words describing what are basically cakes, how do you see the differences between those words there? So the first two of those really have to do with the with the shape, which is interesting. So when the French refer to cake, and they do spell it as we do in America, C-A-K-E, they're really referring to a loaf cake. They're referring to a cake that is baked in a long rectangular pan. And their pan is actually uh, slightly longer and slightly thinner. But I, in my book, everything is for a nine by five pan, if that's what you have. But it really, it's it's clearly adopted from American and British loaf cakes. And, you know, it originally, there's a, well, let me say that there's a, there's an unknown cake that's made in French, which is the cake salé, right? Which is a, literally translates as a savory cake or a salty cake. And those are the cakes that you might have with an aperitif, you might have on the train, you might have on a picnic, you might have in your lunchbox. They are cakes that are basically everything we love about a sandwich poured into the batter. So a great example is a kind of a a ham and gruyere cake, which is so good. And obviously it has no sugar, but you can throw in whatever fantastic cheeses you have in the house. Maybe you have some tomatoes, maybe you have some fresh herbs, some chives, some scallions, some dill. They're really fantastic. And, you know, the when I started hearing the word cake in French, it, it at first really referred to those. And then that 
kind of over the years, I think got expanded. And now everything that is in the shape of a loaf and a very simple cake like that is called a cake. And a gâteau is is really a cake in the way that we call it cake, which is it could be a simple one layer cake, or it could be two layer cakes, or it could be a fantastic genoise that's built into, you know, a towering confection, but it is truly a sweet cake. And it is usually round or square, and it's baked in a cake pan. So it really is that simple. And then you know, the big question that you're asking, though, which I love is, is what the difference really between cake and pastry is, or, you know, a gâteau and a patisserie. And that is truly fundamental to what I wanted to do in my book, because I think there is this perception that in France, people either, you know, are born having these genetic superpowers and come home at the end of the day and make incredible patisserie with, you know, multi layers of exquisite, you know, mille foy and things like that. And the reality is, is that they, in fact, come home very often and will bake a very simple cake. And I think there's, there's a, um, how can I say this? There's, there's not a lot of awareness about this outside of France, I realized. I think most people not only assume the genetic superpowers, but they assume that if you don't have time or you, or you're not a great pastry maker, that you just shop in patisseries and completely understood because everybody does and you do for special occasions and you also do kind of in a daily way. But at home, when when the French are gathering en famille with their family, with close friends, they will often just open up the pantry, take out a couple of really simple ingredients and put a cake together in 10 minutes or less. And because so many of the recipes they use are what we call back pocket recipes, you know, the tried and true recipes that we've made hundreds of times and no work and can almost do in our sleep. They then have the confidence to play around with those recipes and maybe take a basic yogurt cake, but add a little bit of orange blossom water or a little bit of rose water, or maybe it's apple season and they add a little bit of calvados and some diced apples or even some lightly sauteed apples. Or, you know, in pear season, maybe a little bit of chopped pears and some poire william. There's so many things. You can toss raspberries and you can toss almost anything into so many simple French cakes that what I find is that the French tend to use a kind of a canon almost of recipes that have really stood the test of time and been around. And then on a daily basis, while they're making dinner or chatting with friends, they might just look and see what they have in the fridge, what fruit is on the counter, what chocolate might be in their cupboard and and add at will because they know it'll work. Yeah, it's just such an interesting dichotomy between those super widely available, relatively inexpensive, but very ornate pastries that are visible to any visitor to Paris because they're everywhere. But that when you're actually going into a French home on like a Tuesday, they will, and this surprised me when I first started having dinner at at French people's houses, they will have dessert seven days a week, obviously overgeneralizing. But nine times out of 10, it's going to be a yogurt or a pudding cup or one of these super easy, as you call them, back pocket cake recipes. And those more like the eclairs and the tartlets and the Saint Honoré and all of these things sort of brimming with cream and beautiful garnishes, those are more going to be for birthdays, maybe for a Sunday lunch. Is that kind of right? I think so. You know, France has gotten a lot more casual in recent years and Paris has too. You know, traditionally, you were never supposed to serve individual pastries at a dinner party. Mm. It was always, you always served one large tart or one large gâteau or one large, you know, opéra, whatever it was. And that the little, you know, the individual pastries that you just, you would pick up as you were taking a walk or you were having a goûter or you were having a little snack or whatever it was. Almost everybody I know in France does have something sweet seven days a week. And they could never do that if they ate pastry seven days a week, right? You know, it's too much. They would be unhealthy. It's, it would be, they'd be enormous. Not at all the case. What they really, what enables them to do that and to have a little something sweet at the end of every meal is the fact that that they often do have a very, very simple cake that is not overly sweet. It's very different from the kind of American frosted layer cake where you're getting masses of sugar and masses of amounts of icing and very, very sweet, you know, fundamentally vanilla or chocolate cakes. These are cakes that are really based in flavor. And so when you bite into a homemade French cake, one of the things you'll notice is that they tend not to be as sweet as American cakes, and they tend to be very flavor forward. So that instead of that immediate impression of sugar you get when you first bite into a cake here in the States, in France, when you bite into a cake, you will get the sensation of, 
you know, let's say it's chocolate or hazelnut or almond or, you know, raspberry, whatever, whatever the cake is about will be what you taste first, which I love. And they tend to be very simple one layer cakes. So maybe they'll have a dusting of powdered sugar, maybe a little bit of chocolate ganache on top, maybe a little bit of a soaking syrup or quick glaze, but they tend to be not too sweet, very rarely iced, very rarely layered, at least for a, you know, a normal night and something that will tend to last a couple of days. And, and that is, is an indulgence, but is not such a huge indulgence that you can't have one the next night as well. And the next night. And the other practicality, of course, in this is not just that they can do it every night because they're not too sweet, but because they are truly so simple to make. And, you know, as as you and I know, the French are, in fact, very frugal. So they, if they can make something at home, they very often will instead of going out. And it actually, if it takes 10 or 15 minutes to put together a cake, it might take 20 minutes even to run down to the local patisserie and, and buy something. I mean, I love that you were talking about the simplicity of these cakes. One of these cakes that we've talked about and that you actually start your book with, which I love, it makes total sense to me, is the yogurt cake, the gâteau au yogurt. And this is a cake that is particularly popular among children, and it's actually a popular cake for kids to make, right? Yes. It is so easy to make. You learn how to make this cake literally when you're in maternelle, which is somewhere between, you know, nursery school and kindergarten, essentially. So you will look in the window, let's say, of a maternelle, and you will see these kids, these tiny little kids who are like three and four and five with a bowl and a whisk and a little yogurt cup that's either glass or ceramic usually. And they'll just dump the yogurt into the bowl. And then they will use that jar, that yogurt jar to measure out the rest of their ingredients. And it couldn't be more simple. And it becomes a recipe that is is essentially on the curriculum, right? So everybody knows how to make it. When I arrived in Paris at the age of 10, you know, I was already like six years behind in, in, uh, in all of this because everybody else knew how to make this. And that cake is really a great what we would tra- translate as a snack cake for goûter, which is usually at around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. Interestingly, almost the same time as the Brits have tea and we tend to have coffee. It's that moment, you know, after school where you feel a little bit of slump and you're a little bit hungry and it still is a couple hours to dinner. And yogurt cakes are great. And I would go home to friends' houses and, and there would be a yogurt cake on the counter. And, you know, you'd have a little satisfying slice and it would kind of tide you over to dinner. They're moist. And one of the things that make them really, really easy for kids and for novice bakers is that because they actually do have oil in them and they have yogurt, both of which tenderize instead of creating gluten, you can really, really whisk them. So so you don't have what I think so many people are afraid of in cake making, which is the the worry that they will get a tough cake, that they will somehow overmix with the flour and the flour will turn into gluten and will make a tough crumb. So when you are, when you're using oil or you're using yogurt or here, if you're using buttermilk, that tends to immediately tenderize the flour and, and create a very moist cake. So they're, they're a hot table. They're totally foolproof. And then, you know, you can, you can do what, you know, my friend Delphine does who has, you know, four little kids and she'll make one and she'll slice it in half and she will maybe put a little Grand Marnier and a little bit of, you know, maybe a little bit of glaze on half of it and save that for grownups and then keep the the non-alcoholic half of the cake for the kids. So it's very, it's just a very, very easy, adaptable, casual cake. And the other one that I just, I have to talk about because it's so good is, again, what would translate as a four-fourths cake. So similar to our pound cake, but it's based in France on the weight of eggs because eggs was always the thing that farmers didn't know how many they would have, right? Your hen could lay three eggs or seven eggs and however many eggs you had would determine the weight of the other ingredients and you would weigh the egg in the shell first. And then, you know, you would do four of the the flour and the sugar and the butter and really fantastic. And again, what's really interesting about that recipe and what makes it totally foolproof is that you are melting the butter instead of creaming the butter. And once you add the melted butter to flour, you again prevent the formation of a tough crumb because you are essentially shielding the flour from the water in egg whites, which as we know, when you mix egg whites or when you mix water essentially in flour is when you get that tough crumb. So again, super, super easy, really easy for kids. Very, very forgiving for anybody who is worried about overmixing a cake. You cannot overmix that cake either. And it is one of those cakes where, you know, in the summer, I will sometimes take some, some fresh lavender and put it in a blender or a food processor with some 
some sugar and some lemon zest, you know, and use that to bake it. Or maybe I'll take some rose petals and, you know, steep them in a little bit of simple syrup and put a glaze of that on top. Really, really adaptable recipe. You can fill it with all sorts of things. And again, super, super easy. Learned as a kid. And, you know, once you have that recipe, you never forget it. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Paris, a state of mind where real estate experts, Gail and Marie give you all the tips and tricks you need about renting and buying apartments in Paris and beyond. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. And you have so many creative plays on this, you know, some of the ones you've talked about and tons of others in your book, which I mean, is such a fun way to sort of explore this approach to French baking that I think we don't necessarily always think about because we always imagine them having these super ornate pastries. But I personally don't know any French person who goes home and makes a Paris-Brest from scratch. Oh, God, no. No, no. And you know what I love about the French practical attitude is really, you know what, leave that to the professionals. The pastry makers are people who have trained and they've done stage and they've been to, maybe they've been to culinary school or maybe they've been working in pastry shops since they were 13 or 14 years old. And by the time they open up a shop in Paris or are even responsible for making a cake in somebody else's bakery in Paris, they will have had so much experience and they will be devoting so much time and they'll have so much equipment. They're the ones to make the patisserie. And, you know, the French don't really try to compete with them or they don't try and compete with their chefs. French home cooking is so fundamentally different from French restaurant cooking. And that's, that is as true in, in sweet and savory both. And I, I love that because it kind of, it's like two different arts and it, it lets people off the hook. And it, it's a wonderful way to entertain too, because you don't have that stress that I see so often in American friends. And I'm certainly have been guilty of this many times before too, where, you know, I have a great cookbook by a new chef and the recipes are, you know, three pages long. And I think, oh my God, I'm going to make this for the next dinner party and have friends over. And then, you know, inevitably, you know, I'm in the kitchen at 10 at night and they're all (laughs) having a glass of wine and having fun in the other room. And I'm thinking, why did I just not make something really classically French that I know how to do as opposed to trying to put together a restaurant meal, you know, particularly on a weeknight. It's crazy. So I love the kind of carefree, casual confidence of that. And I love the idea that you don't, you're not cooking for people who expect you to do something wildly different. They just expect you and hope that you're going to cook well and respect your ingredients and make something tried and true that everybody loves. It's a much more, um, it's a much more forgiving, I think, way of having people over. Absolutely. And I think it, it continues into, I mean, so much of this. I know a lot of French men who cook. I actually think I probably know more French men who cook than American men. And I, I often find, I don't know why this is, that the formula tends to be that, you know, the woman in any sort of given home will cook on weeknights and then the guy busts out all the stops on the weekends and makes the entertainment meals. Yes. And I think that's maybe neither here nor there. But either way, whoever is doing the preparation of the food I feel like in the States, it's such a stereotype that it's almost become a trope that like a major scare quotes, bad mom or like a busy mom couldn't possibly find the time to bake something for the bake sale or to make a homemade dessert. And so she buys it in. And I feel like that sort of judgment wouldn't translate in France because to source something fantastic is almost just as laudable as if you made something yourself. And if the thing you sourced is better than the thing you would have been able to make yourself, power to you for buying it, kind of. Absolutely agree. And But then, of course, if you're in France, I think people would also know, hey, I can make something in 15 minutes. It's going to be good. So the flip side is, is it's not it doesn't feel like an overwhelming ask. It doesn't feel like an intimidating ask. And I really, really wanted to convey that. I mean, so much of why I wrote this book was, you know, it's the beginning of the pandemic and everybody needed a little bit of comfort, but also everybody was incredibly busy. And I thought, you know what? People don't really realize that these cakes exist. There hasn't been a book about the cakes that French people bake at home. I was kind of stunned to find that out. And I realized, wait a second, this like the word needs to get out here that there are these, you know, incredibly simple, fantastic recipes that are just part of of life. And they're not known in the way that savory cakes are not known, you know, outside of France, because they're not, unless you have French friends who are close and invite you over to their house, it is a world in which you're not 
you're not going to know it. You won't have tasted it, or maybe you've tasted it once or twice, but you won't really understand that it's it's this entire world of cooking that is is kind of behind closed doors. And the French are, you know, as we know, they're incredibly gracious. When you become friends with somebody in France, you tend to not go to that person's house right away. You usually meet somewhere else. You maybe meet in a cafe. Maybe you all have dinner together. Inviting somebody to the home is is something you do when you when there's already a degree of warmth and and I think friendship already. And then it can be a very simple affair. But the French are also, you know, they're, they have, there's so many different levels. And one of the things I wanted to do with this book is I wanted to say, okay, here are the really easy cakes that you can make. These are the yogurt cakes. These are the pound cakes. These are the, the very simple kind of nut torts, which I love, which are also gluten-free where you just, you have a, a fantastic one layer cake that takes, you know, almost no time to make and is about walnuts or maybe it's hazelnuts or maybe it's pistachios. Really, really good. Again, not too sweet, very simple. Or the cakes with fruit where you're just tossing in whatever fantastic fruit you have. And the French do use a lot of booze when they cook. So very often they will just, they'll add a little bit of creme de cassis for a berry cake or they'll add a little bit of armagnac if they're adding prunes or they will add a little bit of calvados if they're adding apples and kind of augment the flavor very, very simply with those liquors instead of with more sugar um, or instead of with vanilla, which can be so overpowering or cinnamon, which can be so overpowering. So you've got all of those easy cakes. And then, of course, the French also really do, like everybody, they love to celebrate. And and if they're having, you know, a fancier dinner party, they might go and get a, you know, a beautiful tart, or maybe they will make a slightly more composed cake, for lack of a better word, right? Maybe it's going to be two layers of a chinoise with a little bit of whipped cream in the middle or a little bit of ganache on top. Very, very simple too. And then there's kind of the pulling out all the stops if there's a a kind of great Sunday lunch, and you're bringing people over and maybe you make then a dacquoise, which is, again, super simple, but looks spectacular. It's these round discs that you make of meringue, and you can make them as high as you want. But let's say you're using three kind of eight inch rounds of meringue, and you're adding berries, and you're adding whipped cream, or maybe if you want to be a little fancier, you're adding buttercream, and you're kind of stacking this and and adding some fruit on top and a little bit more whipped cream. And the whole thing looks very, very sensational and fun. And is maybe slightly more elaborate and slightly more time consuming than a basic cake, but not terribly, but has a kind of festive look. And then, you know, then we're, of course, getting to the to the Bush Noel, which, as you know, like, it, Christmas has to end with a Bush Noel in France. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of a fundamental. It's a law. <laughs> and I love that. I, the, I also love that about the French. It's like you cannot find a log cake any other time of year, right? You can you can maybe find something that is rolled and looks a little bit like it, but is not, it's, you know, like there are, it is reserved for one day a year and the rest of the, you know, 364 days, you get to dream about it. And that anticipation of having it, I think is part of the pleasure. Oh my God. But seasonality in France, I mean, it's a whole other, I could wax poetic all day long about how much they adhere to the seasonality of yes, fruits and vegetables, but also certain dish, like I just had a mont d'or and I skated it in right at the end. You know, you can't eat it after, or they don't make it after the 15th of March. Exactly. Which is kind of when you think about it, because some of these cakes are so good, you think, wait a second, why are they not in constant rotation? Yeah. But it's all about the ritual and the ritual does have so much magic to it because you are, you have that anticipation. I mean, it's kind of a, it's a seduction, right? You know, it's coming, you're waiting, you're hoping, you're wondering what it's going to be. You know, is it going to be a a yuzu bush noel? Is it going to be a black forest one? Is it going to be a chestnut or a chocolate? And you kind of, you get to play around with that for the, you know, November and December until, until you actually have it. And I think there's something fantastically special about that. That I love. Now, you have mentioned a couple of times so far in our conversation, and I need to circle back and shine a light on it, this whole category of cake salé, savory cakes, which is one of my favorite things in France. I think it ticks a lot of boxes that we've been talking about in that it's something that's easily made in advance. You can easily throw it together. You can easily open the fridge or the pantry and be like, okay, I've got sun-dried tomatoes and olives and cheese, and I'll throw it all together. And you can bring it on a picnic. You can cut it into slices and serve it for an aperitif. My question to you is, why on earth do Americans... Americans were fine with quiche. We did it. Why are we not making cake salé? It seems like this best kept secret of France. 
I'm hoping people will buy copies of my book, Ghetto, and, and we'll start making them because they're so good. But I think I think they really are unknown outside of France because they really are only served in France at home. And so if you, again, if you don't have really good French friends and go to their houses in France and maybe have a cake salad, you will never know about it. I'd, I've never seen, maybe I've seen one for sale once or twice, but generally they're actually really hard to find because they are definitely something that you eat at home and you make at home and not something that you buy. And I, one of the things I... I find about them too is that because they are so adaptable and and you can you can kind of take influences from other cultures. So one of the ones in my book has you know has chorizo in it and and peppers and is a little bit more on the Mexican side actually. And then I do a, a caprese version, which is you know essentially like everything you love about a caprese salad. It is that that last bite where you kind of take a, a piece of bread and you wipe it across the plane and you get a little bit of olive oil and you get a little bit of tomato and you get a little bit of basil and a little bit of mozzarella. And it's all of that in a cake. But I think that they are not known really because they are such a part of, you know, of, of home life, but not something that you can purchase. And, um, but I think they should be. And I'm making one tonight. I realize I have, you know, I'm going to somebody's house for a glass of wine before dinner and they ask me to bring something and it'll take me take me 15 minutes to get it in the oven at the most. And I've got a couple things of cheese in the fridge that are going to go right in. And I've got some fantastic chives and I've got some dill, which I might even use. And I've got some shallots, maybe some leeks. You know, it's really, really playful. I hope that they become better known because they are incredibly great for, among other things, lunchboxes. And this was another thing I learned during the pandemic because I don't, you know, my son was at home I am not really a person who makes lunch. I love making dinner, but I don't really like making lunch. But suddenly, you know, it was lunchtime. Wow. Okay. These are cakes that unlike sandwiches, which need to be refrigerated or need to be, you know, sandwiches are almost never at the right temperature, right? It's like you, if you make a sandwich, you should eat it right away. Or, you know, maybe it sits at room temperature for 20 minutes. But if you put it in the fridge, it tastes terrible. And if you leave it out, it gets mushy. And so they're actually terrible lunchbox ideas except that they're, you know, they're practical and you eat them with your hands. These savory cakes are so good because they can be at room temperature. They don't need to be refrigerated. They've got some oil in them, so they will last easily for two or three days. You can pack in, you know, even some vegetables if you want, some protein. You kind of can get everything into them. And because they did last a few days, we just kind of had them in rotation during the pandemic because you could, you know, make one and by the third day, maybe you're toasting it and drizzling it with olive oil, but it's still going to be really good. And, you know, and that was, of course, during the pandemic, usually, you know, I'll make one if I'm having somebody over for a drink at night, and and then it will just kind of go into whatever the other meals are <laughs> during the course of the week, right? Very practically. But it is funny. And I think, you know, I don't know how quiche became such a icon in a way, and it's much more laborious. And doesn't keep as well, right? I mean, you yeah. need a quiche basically the, the day it's made and, and probably not have it refrigerated and, and not have it. But I do, I, listen, I love quiche. I, you know, I, I love the way the French often make quiche, which is, you know, is actually to make it a little bit deeper and to really keep the interior very, very custard-like so that it, it doesn't feel heavy. It has that, that almost, um, well, it's deceptively, deceptively light, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not truly light. But it has that it, it, you can really taste that kind of egg custard, which I think is great and, um, and takes a ton of skill. If you're enjoying this podcast, you may enjoy our sister podcast, Molly on a Trip Music Around Paris, which is brand new to the Paris Underground Radio Network. Music industry expat Molly Lehman has moved to Paris and taken her love of music with her. Each episode, Molly sits down with local French artists or touring musicians from all over the world to talk about what's going on in their careers and what inspires them. Get insights on what these musicians love most about Paris. Check out Molly on a Trip, Music Around Paris Now, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. Now, when you were talking about some of your savory cake recipes, you actually brushed up on another question that I had for you, which is that you know, when we, when you were comparing cakes to some of the bakes that we make in, you know, Anglo-Saxon countries, be it, you know, the US or the UK, I started wondering, you know, cake seems like something that's so simple and that can incorporate so many of these foreign influences. 
And I feel like so many people believe that the French are going to poo-poo anything that isn't French. But the reality has not always been that case and is even less so the case now. I mean, what, what do you think about how the French feel about having foreign influences infiltrating their baking style? I am so glad you asked that, Emily, because I think it's a huge question. And I think it's also something that is very, very much of the moment. I think in the last 10 years, the food, particularly in Paris, has just exploded with a kind of a hunger for foreign influence in a way that I'd never seen before, right? So you do have people waiting online for ramen, you have sushi restaurants, you have, you know, there's more Mexican food. There's always been a fair amount of Middle Eastern food or North African food because of the Mediterranean. But I feel like after Brexit, you know, Paris really did become the most international city in the world. And so it it suddenly opened its borders in a different way, I think. There was a sense of, you know, what we are an international city and we're going to embrace that. Now the French do not they are they are very slow to change their food. And why should they? Because their food is so good. But what I have noticed is, is that they will incorporate foreign ingredients into their own recipes, right? So maybe they will take some Ras al Hanout, the Moroccan spice mix, and they will add that to a basic cake, right? Or maybe they will add a little bit of Berber, the Egyptian spice mix, and do that. Or maybe they will take a little bit of rose water. Or maybe they will actually look to Asia and, and the influence of, say, yuzu, which is enormously popular in France, and even put that into, as I said, a bouche noel or, you know, or even a yogurt cake. And so what I'm seeing more and more is I'm seeing that the French are kind of, their pantry is becoming more international at home. It's not necessarily in the vein of a new recipe as much as it's incorporating things that they like, you know, and and are kind of borrowing and putting them into their own recipes. And I'm seeing that in both savory and sweet food. And I love it because I think it's I think it's late for that. I think other countries have, you know, have opened their doors a little bit earlier. And France has had a very complicated relationship with immigrants. And there really is not a how can I say there's not a great influence of immigrant food in French food. And I don't necessarily expect that that there will be, but I do feel that there is there's an opening to new flavors and to incorporating those into French classics. And cake is so easy to do that with. I mean, there's even a recipe in this book for something I, I developed, which is completely my own crazy idea, but it's fantastic, which is with you know a hot chili infused honey and a little bit of tequila in a madeleine. And it's fantastic. And that to me is a great way to, to kind of to look at, at something that isn't part of your repertoire and say, wait a second, madeleine are made with honey. What if I do a hot honey? And instead of adding, you know, a rum, what if I added tequila and let's see what happens. And I am seeing that happen more and more in France. Exciting. I think it's an exciting time right now. Definitely. Well, Alexander, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. You've made me very hungry. And so before I leave you, probably to go rummage around in my fridge and do something very French and frugal and simple, I would love to know, I have one last question for you. What is your favorite word in French? Oh my God. I never thought you would ask that in a million years. Mm, that is a good question. I do love the word chocolat. Oh yeah. And it's not just because I like chocolate, but I I do love the way that word kind of rolls. Mm-hmm. You know? It, it like you can't you cannot say the word chocolat with a, you know, a downturn face or a, you know, a angry mood. It's just it's one of those words that lifts you. So I would I would definitely say that. Totally. Perfect. Well, thank you so very much for joining me again. Anybody who wants to, and why wouldn't you bake some of these amazing French home bakes can find a link to Alexandra's book in the show notes. And we look forward to reading all of your delicious recipes and hopefully share the results with us on social media. So thank you so much. Emily, that was really fun. Thank you. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.